we are more than aware that the film is actually really long and it's getting very late into the night. So the way we have our panels structured is each of the panelists got their question in advance and we ask them to try to keep their reply down to about six minutes each. And then if people want to stay after for question and answers, the panel will stay here, but we also know that people might, you know, need to get home and take care of themselves. So. And hopefully you all got one of the handouts that introduced each of the panelists, because we didn't want to take up time by doing that, but they'll, I'll have them as they speak, say who they are and what their current, um, you know, sort of role or function within the world of sex offenders is. So we'll start with Gary Marvel. Hi. Hi. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so Gary, can you give us more of the context of the sex offender registry in Vermont? What's currently done for treatment, and what kind of risk do sex offenders pose to the community upon their release, which I actually think was answered pretty well within the um, documentary that I forgot, so if you just focus on the, the sex offender registry in Vermont and the treatment program. You'd have to ask me what you want to know about the sex offender registry. We do have one, as you know, from the, from the um, it's not as restrictive as you'd find in most states. Well, maybe you could explain like how it works, and if if you're aware, and other people may have answers to like how it impacts people in a positive or a negative way. You know, we saw some of the different perspectives on it from Florida. Sure. Does that one work too? No, that's for that <laughs> filming. Oh, okay. So, you have to use yeah. so um, well, the sex offender registry in Vermont, you, you get on after being convicted of a sex offense, the court alerts um, the registry that you're going to need to register. Um, you're not on the registry while you're incarcerated. If you get a sentence that you go directly to the community, then you'd have to register from there. Um, if you go from incarceration, the, the Vermont Department of Corrections is responsible for sending uh, notification that you've been released so that you would uh, then have to follow up and um, give them your address and every time that information changes as far as your um, phone number or where you live, that information has to be passed along to the registry. So, um, we don't have restrictions like you would see in some of the more conservative states, uh, where, they, like some states, for example, um, they'll, like, they have automatic limitations, like where you can live. Um, for example, like out in Indiana, I believe they have one where you can't live with minors if you're on the registry. We don't have any of that. That's, okay. that's determined by supervision. Um, our state is much, much, we're kind of the polar opposite in a lot of regards um, to what you would see in the film. So. so can you talk about the, a lot of the film talked about that there's no treatment offered, what Vermont the Department of Corrections does for people who are convicted of these crimes? We have, yeah, we have the, uh, the TIPSA program. Um, that's the Vermont treatment program for um, sexual abusers and we, that's incarcerated. Um, you can be on the low end, moderate or high, depending on your risk assessments. Um, and that will, that will be determining a time frame that you'll be going to treatment. Um, then when you get out of treatment, um, it's expected that folks that are continuing on supervision will be in some form of treatment community. Um, that's typically done by contract providers that uh, is, is different from each county. And you will typically stay on in, in treatment um, the average, I would say, is expected like about three years is if you're doing well. Um, it can go longer, but it, it, it's typically at least three years that you're going to be in some form of community treatment after release. Okay. Um, one of the things that I forgot to say before we started the panel is that um, Earl, the person who was going to come and talk about his experience having been formally incarcerated and in a COSA, um, at, at the last minute sort of decided not to come, and I think you can probably tell why from the film. We weren't sure if the media was gonna be here. We didn't know if they came, if they would guarantee that he wouldn't be exposed and he just had too much concern for his children and his community and um, the progress that he's made. So um, Earl is not here. Um, and I also forgot to mention in terms of treatment, <clears throat> the Department of Corrections funds uh, community justice centers across the state of Vermont and one of our functions is to provide a program called Circles of Support and Accountability. It's called the COSA program. And we uh, can do a training in the future where we go more in depth about what COSA is and how effective it is. But essentially, it uh, recognizes that in order for people to be successful when they get out of prison, they need to be like integrated into their community. And we know that many of them are marginalized before they went in. So 
Akosa is uh, a reentry coordinator who works for the CJC and a team of three to four uh, trained community volunteers who commit to uh, working with the person who is coming out of prison for a year and to meet with them for an hour, an hour and a half a week in a group um, to essentially um, support them in their success but also hold them accountable to um, what their goals and um, visions are. And you know, there's a lot that happens in ACOSA. Uh, there's a bunch of reactive coordinators in here who maybe can answer questions if people have them after the panel. But um, it, it's a group of people who aren't judging. Um, it's a group of people who are community members that the hope is that they will then in turn help connect that person further with their community. And also it's a place to um, to have sort of a coach or a role model for how do you develop relationships in a healthy way and how do you problem solve and that kind of thing. So that's essentially what the COSA program is, which is what happens on reentry for sex offenders are offered it. Yeah, I, I'd just like to speak really quickly to that. When I was a probation officer, um, that was my last gig before this. Um, I, all of them, not all of them, not a good number of my guys uh, that were on supervision with me were went through COSA. And it's it's really a great tool. It, 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 one of the things I really enjoyed about it was that I can only spend, you know, maybe, you know, a half hour uh, a, a week with any number of my offenders. Um, I might be seeing them in, the, in their homes. I might be seeing them at work. Uh, more often, I see them in the office. I, I don't really get to know them except from what I read and, and you know what I learn about them from their treatment providers. But COSA is the, the volunteers spend a tremendous amount of time. Um, just sort of helping reintegrate them into a normal life. Um, it's really a, a helpful tool for them, but it's also a helpful tool for supervision because you can observe how folks are doing and they can talk to me freely about it and we can have conversations. It doesn't have to be such a punitive approach if somebody's struggling. We can work with them to, um, you know, for example, if I think that they're really having a hard time uh, developing pro-social activities to do, um, that's something that would be observed maybe by their volunteers and we could talk about that. That's not something I'm gonna be able to observe on my own. I could just kind of extrapolate based on what I'm hearing, so. And that sort of mantra that underlies the COSA program is no more uh, secrets and no more victims. So the community, it's a, it's a role that community members can play as volunteers in contributing to the safety in their communities. So we're gonna hold for questions and answers till after we go through the panel, okay? Um, so next we have Tony. Um, Who we have to pass. Oh, let's go sit down. And Tony, what do you think the sex registry and related laws and how we handle the issue is in Vermont? Uh, you know, it's an interesting and probably challenging question for me to answer. So I'm going to share a bit about my story and then I'll loop around to it. But the reason I'm on the panel is because I am someone who was the victim of childhood sexual abuse and it was my father. And um, in 2009, I decided to, um, for a variety of reasons, to do a, um, begin a do some research on my grandfather because I knew very little about him. I knew that he had been, he had shot himself in the heart with a 35 caliber rifle out at a gold mining camp outside of Chicken, Alaska. I knew he was a womanizer. I knew he was a bootlegger. And that he had convicted, con, um, he could have, what do you call, committed is the word, my grandmother to um, the Fergus, Fergus Falls Insane Asylum in 1923 where she remained for 40 years. I knew those things. Um, and I began this, I went to Minnesota um, and I started at the Assane Asylum. I went north to Thief River Falls where I, my grandparents had lived, over to the um, Red Lake Indian Reservation where I have many relatives on the Ojibwa Nation and down through Nebish where my father grew up, um, where my grandparents lived, and down into Bemidji. And when I hit Bemidji, I went to their historical society and I really love historical societies. I found this book, it's called Nebish Book of Memories. And in it, I found some information about my grandparents. And I found the photo of a woman who I had recognized as a childhood name um, from growing up. And so I contacted Angie. Angie was 80-something at the time. I have little photos. There's me with Angie. Um, she said she knew my grandmother and took taken care of her when she got was released from the insane asylum, because my grandmother actually was not insane. Um, but had spent 40 years there. She was out for three years, and Angie helped care for her, but she 
said, call, go see my aunt who was 99. Her name is Anna. She knew both your grandparents. No one had ever known both of my grandparents. I find this 99-year-old woman, and this is Anna, and when I walk into her assisted care home, she hands me this photo. It's my aunt. It's from 1927. It's my paternal aunt. And on the back it says, May Cook, daughter of the notorious Frank Cook of Nebish. I felt so sorry for her. I took care of her for a summer while her, grand while her father was in prison. And I asked Anna, my grandfather was in prison? And she said, yep. And she would not tell me the crime. So I am forever indebted to the Department of Corrections of Minnesota. I called them. They said, well, try the Historical Society, which I did, because they said they might have the records. I needed an indictment number. So I contacted a researcher, that because um, I'm now back in Vermont, um, who had previously worked at the Historical Society. And we agreed upon five hours of work that she would do to search some for information. She did her five hours, thankfully knew the librarian from having worked there, and the librarian asked her, what are you looking for? And she said, well, I'm trying to find out if this man um, spent time in prison at, Still, at Stillwater State Penitentiary. And the woman said, oh, come here, I have a secret card catalog behind the counter, and it lists all the inmates that have ever been in the penitentiary. And sure enough, under my family name, we found my grandfather. And she filled out the appropriate work, and the archivist went down into the bowels of the Minnesota Historical Society and came back with 350 pages documenting my grandfather's criminal history, with the primary crime being, at the time it was called, carnal knowledge of girls under the age of 18. So when I heard that truth, my whole central nervous system actually relaxed because my life made sense. And in that moment, too, interestingly, my father was forgiven. Notice that I didn't forgive my father. My father was forgiven. It just happened. And then it was my grandfather. And I, because there was something, it was about him. I had to read through those documents. It is stunning what was in those documents. And I wish I had more time to share it, because I love sharing it. But I, and it took me quite a while to have to work through that, you know, I, I, the DNA I carry is that of a man who, who did, um, I, Mabel, Maud, and there's other girls, um, actually, and one of them was related to Anna, which is why she wouldn't tell me the crime, and he did commit my grandmother to silence her. Um, so I needed to come to terms with that and have done that. <laughs> Um, and in, many, some of you have heard this, but in 2014, I decided to attend the sentencing of a sex offender. About the time that I had started my search about my grandfather, a horrendous crime was committed in this state. Michael Jakes kidnapped, raped, and killed his 12-year-old niece. And I could never look at the paper during that crime. But in 2014, I saw his picture on the front of the paper, and I actually read the article. And he didn't have a whole you know, nervous breakdown or panic attack or anything else. I read the article and the sentencing was happening on Tuesday, that next Tuesday in Burlington, and I went. And I went because I wanted to see how, where I was in my healing process. Could I go there and keep my heart open to him? There is no doubt I keep my heart open to Brooke Bennett. In fact, I often speak because she can't. She gave her life for this cause. We owe it to her to end this today, you know, sexual abuse of ch children. And it can, but I stayed, I went there to see, could I keep my heart open to him? Because it, you know, it's tough to live in the world when you hate yourself because of your DNA. And during the sentencing, Brooke's grandmother spoke. And at one point, she pointed her finger at, at Michael Jakes and said, look at me, look at me. And he did. And she said, there is nothing good about you. And in that moment, for me, because I, she, it came right through into me, and it was a moment of healing for me. One, I got for the first time in my entire life that yes, there is. There's something good about him because I am the daughter of one of him, and my two kids are the grandkids. There is, he was born like you and me, a vulnerable and innocent baby, and something happened. And the other thing that happened in that courtroom is I had a vision. I'm a developmental psychologist. I'm a um, my. I play with consciousness as my art. It's what has healed me. And I saw how we can end this crime. We have what it takes to do it. We, we totally do. And so getting back to the question at hand, and I haven't gotten my warning yet. I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> okay, so. Um, 
You know, I, we absolutely have to end this. We have to name the evil, the crime, we've got to stop it. But we can't do it if we only see the bad, we have to see the good. And I don't care if it's someone who has victimized or it's someone who's been a victim, you need to see our goodness and help us see that and pull that out so that we can see that there's more to us than the toxic shame that resides once you've been victimized or the toxic shame I, that can be there if you have victimized. Or, you know, so we need to know and see the goodness in all of us so that that is something that we can, we can work on, we can build. I know for a fact my grandfather was a really good hunting and fishing guide. I know that he really cared about horses and cows. People called him to take care of their animals. And I know he's a really good shot. He could throw a quarter up and he could shoot it and hit it every time. There's good things about everybody. So if we draw those out, then the problems can become lesser and the good things can become bigger. So COSAs, uh, what I think in Vermont is, it's awesome that we have COSAs. We need them for victims too. We all need support. These crimes, these abuses happen in relationship. They can only be healed in relationship. There's no other way to do it. You isolate uh, any human being, they're gonna go to survival instincts and they're gonna do something to survive. That's what we do. Any one of us would. We are them. Whoever the them is, we are them. So I totally applaud you know, the, the COSAs that we have in this state. We need more of that. We need community. We need people who care enough to care enough about this world to get over our fear and our abhorrence and everything else, to see the goodness in each and every one of us, and to draw that out so that the other crap that we do as humans None of us is pure in here, so that that no longer makes sense, but the connection, the love, and the care does. So that's what I think about the state of Vermont's law, that we just need more of that. And we absolutely have to have prison. If, you know, there's people that may not have this, I mean, Jake's earned his right to stay in prison for life plus 70. Not a problem. But while he's there, he could be doing something to restore justice to those he harmed. I don't know if he is or not. But I believe he, I know he's got family, I believe he has a daughter. You know, and there, there needs to be more done, no matter what, where we are, whether they're in prison or out, and for the families of the victims that allow people to heal and to be restored and reintegrated into the community. So now I've really been kicked off. So thank you. <laughs> Next we go to Bess. Oh, boy. There you go. So Bess. Oh, it's going to be hard to call. Um, you have chosen so many interesting topics for your films. How did you come to choose focusing on coaches for your current project? Um. Well, I often joke because I've been making documentary films for 25 years, and when you go down the list, it's like uh, my first film I made on domestic violence, I've made a movie about a girl who was murdered, I've made movies on foster care, heroin addiction, opiate addiction, eating disorders, and now I'm doing the COAST program about people coming out of jail. So it's not exactly running through the fields with daisies in your hair. Um, it's all, you know, challenging, uh, issues that Vermont deals with and of course the world deals with. Um, you know, I mean, for me as a documentary filmmaker, uh, this film that I'm making, I've, I've, I've finished uh, shooting the film, I'm now editing it, it's gonna tour next fall through Vermont. It's about five people coming out of prison in Vermont. One of them is a sex offender. Um, the other people are drug dealers, uh, addicts, sexual, uh, no, assault, domestic violence folks, um, and so none of them are, you know, they, they all have challenges, and they're all coming out of prison, they're all going into COSAs, and so I follow five of them through this process, and the film will be about that. And for me, I'm just really interested in the backstory. I'm really interested in looking behind the headlines, quote unquote, um, that we often get as, as community members of just sort of the fear the fear thing of, you know, there are all these horrible people out there, whether they're a heroin addict or whether they're a sexual sex offender, um, and that we have to be fearful of them and that they have to be punished. And that's fine at some, some level, but for me, um, as a documentary filmmaker, I want to find out who these people are, like you were saying. What is their background? What are the systemic reasons for making them be this way? Um, and 
the idea that there is more to them than the worst thing that they've do done. I mean, as somebody says in the film, you know, I don't th I think any of us would want a scarlet letter on the back of our, or in the front of our uh, head, you know, saying this is something I did really stupid when I was in college and, you know, everybody needs to know this 24 hours a day. We, we move on, we, we get through that, we learn from it, so on and so forth. Um, I just would say that the sexual sex offender that I am following in Vermont, um, if you met him, you would never in a million years be scared of him. He's 32, he's smart, he's funny, he um, has a job at the Dunkin' Donuts um, in a particular town in Vermont. Um, his employers love him, he's the best worker there. Um, he goes to a book group every week with um, two little old ladies who think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, he's adorable, he's wonderful, he's got so much potential. And um, A, I would just like to say that he's extremely brave to be in my movie. Extremely brave, because um, he's going to be there on a big screen like that, um, and as, as were these people who were in this movie, they were very brave to speak out. Um, and we're not gonna fuzz his face, we're not gonna change his name, um, and people are gonna hear his story. And, um, you know, the deal with him is that he actually had an obsession with porn. He got connected, got sort of sucked into younger girls and connected with somebody online who he was gonna meet. He was, I think, 23, she was 14. And they, he was going to go meet her down in Brattleboro, and he drove down there, and he pulled into the drop to the parking lot, and it was a sting. And so the police came, and they arrested him immediately, took him to jail. Um, so he actually never did anything wrong. I mean, he never hurt anybody. Um, he was definitely going down that road. It was not a good thing. But I think one of the big challenges in all of this is that, as far as I'm concerned, um, the word sex offender needs to be changed to a number of different categories of sex offender because I think when we think of sex offender, we think of the guy who has, you know, kidnapped two girls and put them in their his basement and abused them for five years or ten years. That's that's bad. That's really, really bad. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is this kid who is going down the road, you know, got got caught and now is on the sex offender registry for 15 years. Um, and had, you know, was trying to put his life together. So, the, one of the first things I would like to talk about is different categories and names that we can try to get people in our society to start to recognize as different levels of sex offense so that not everybody is thrown into the same pot. So that's a long answer to your question. Um, the film hopefully will spark conversation. We're gonna tour the film with the people in the movie. So there will be Q and A's afterwards with those people, and um, we need more COSAs. They are incredibly important. Such a simple concept. It's like instead of having people come out of jail and throwing them onto the street and saying good luck, we actually say, hey, why don't you come and sit in a circle with us, and we'll help you integrate back into the community. And not only are we helping you, but we've got eyes on you. Like what you were saying, you know, you throw them into this little corner and say, "Go, keep over to that side of the railroad track. We don't like you. You're alienating. Go over there." Do you think that when they go over there, that that we're safer? I don't. I want to know what these people are doing. I want to help them become better citizens. I don't want them over here in some creepy little corner where they can easily do the same thing. I don't care if they're a heroin addict. I don't care if they're a sex offender. I don't care if they're somebody who's beating up their wife. We need to bring them towards us instead of pushing them away. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to see you in the same room as Ron Booker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, you should talk to Tom Dunn okay. about those sex offender categories. Yeah. Um, so next we're gonna go to Sharon, mm -hmm. who has served on a COSA mm -hmm. um, with Earl, who is not here tonight. Um, can you share with us what motivated you to volunteer with the COSA specifically and what just your thoughts about it. So what motivated me to serve on a COSA is um, actually something that hasn't really come up in the conversation yet tonight or in the movie directly, which is that I believe that when we send people to prison, 
we as a society are actually inflicting great harm on those people that are in prison. And while I have a lot of emotions and a lot of philosophical beliefs and a lot of reasons why I'm working with COSA, really, when they sent the question ahead of time, that is the core for me, that I believe that we are doing harm to people when we send them to prison. And I feel like as a member of society, I want to do what I can to help um, uh, alleviate or remediate some of that harm. Um, that's important to me. I, Excellent, concise yeah. answer. <laughs> it's concise, that's what it's about. It, you know, some other things that are coming up, just hearing the other people speak, is that um, COSA is uh, funded by the DOC, Department of Corrections. Um, I don't like being part of the DOC. <laughs> and when, I, I've been in two COSA so far, and it's been very important to me when I sit down with folks for in the first or second visit to say, just so you know, I'm not the DOC. Please don't treat me like the DOC. I'm, I'm here in a different capacity. I'm not paid by the DOC. <laughs> I am beholden to agreements with the DOC just like you are, and so let's figure this out together. Because as a COSA volunteer, we are technically volunteers of the DOC and have to sign on to a whole bunch of um, agreements about so I've signed on to a bunch of my agree agreements about my behavior in the COSA, which I don't always agree with. And I feel like that just gives me even more empathy for the person who's coming out of prison who has a list of um, agreements with the DOC, their conditions of release that makes my little list look ridiculous, ridiculously puny. Um, when we talk about people coming out, imagine how hard it is to get a job. So one of the things I'm learning about through COSA is what, what people actually have to deal with when they come out of prison. And part of it is the stigma that so many of us carry about whatever their crime was. Um, but there are also a lot of conditions which I personally would have a really hard time living with. Um, so every time Earl would go to get a job, which he needs to get because he has to pay for housing, which he needs to get because he has to pay for his own, they call it programming, so that the own required therapies, the conditions of his release, he has to go to this certain programming. He needs to pay for that. You know, he's gotta pay for his own food. There are all kinds of things he has to pay for, so what's one of his first tasks? Find a job. What's one of the requirements of his being released, serving the end of his sentence in the community, because that's technically what he's doing. Every time he has a job interview, if he's offered a job, he needs to tell people about his crime. So just think about the thing that you maybe feel most ashamed about in your life, or the thing that's maybe the hardest for you to talk about, and imagine having to share that every time you're offered a job. And, you know, how many jobs are you going to get? <laughs> so um, I... Uh, you know, I could bask in the light of everybody talking about how great COSA is and, oh, thank you for the volunteers, but really I have to say that for me, it's an invaluable learning experience and it gives me a window into lives and conditions and things that I'm actually a part of by being part of this society that my tax dollars go towards that I would not otherwise have access to. Um, I learn a lot about our criminal justice system. I learn a lot about our Department of Corrections. I learn a lot about um, the amazing fortitude and resiliency it takes to be able to come out of prison and function <laughs> in society. So thank you. Yeah. And lastly, we'll go to Kathy Fox, who's got a lot of research on the COVID program. You could share with us what you've learned. Well, let's see. Um, so I've been doing research on COSA for 10 years or so. Um, and uh, I, 
a couple things. One is that it, it really is a, a practice that's based on research evidence. So, for example, sex offenders in particular, one of their risk factors that makes them more likely to reoffend is isolation. Um, and so the, the social supports that are uh, part of COSA are really essential. The other thing, in, uh, you know, echoing what you said, is that being in prison itself is criminogenic, which means it increases your likelihood of reoffending, all other things being equal. So they come out with a, a lot of um, barriers and obstacles, and um, one of the reasons that COSA works is because it is not DOC. Um, the volunteers the fact that they're unpaid volunteers is what a lot of the core members, the people who had a COSA, have said is what was really powerful to them, um, that ordinary citizens would spend their time uh, trying to help them. And, you know, in, in so far as the volunteers function quite differently than the DOC, they're actually adding a different value. It's, you know, because otherwise they might look like a parole board or something. Um, but they actually manage to help people stay within those very stringent conditions um, by doing things like driving them if they're not allowed to drive, um, spending time with them. And when they're most effective, it's when they help the core member to develop another self, right? Another uh, person, uh, persona in the world, or another narrative about themselves. So the research also shows that people who stop doing crimes and commit to that are people who can, um, are allowed the space to see themselves as something other than a criminal, right? So there's a lot of things in our uh, system where we're reminding them that they're criminals and that they are offenders and they're this and that and that, you know, that no matter what they're trying to do, we're sort of waiting for them to reoffend, or we're, you know, we are putting all these sorts of things in place that make it very difficult for them to forget for a second. And I'm not saying that, you know, that we should ask them to forget, we still need to hold them accountable, but to the extent that we can help them develop other parts of themselves, the, the more um, ordinary, conventional parts. So, for example, COSA sometimes will do things like, okay, well, yeah, you did this terrible thing, we've talked about it, you've done your time. What else are you besides that? Um, what did you used to like to do? Um, you know, or what have you always wanted to learn to do? And then somebody would say, oh, I used to like to go fishing. I go, okay, let's go fishing. And, and then you're, um, you can see yourself as someone who can hang around ordinary people doing ordinary things um, and you know, have a place at the table, basically. Uh, also, because a lot of times people have been in for a long time and they're really institutionalized, they don't know how to function on the outside quite. Um, and so the team can actually help um, adjust to things like, well, here's how you use a cell phone. They didn't have cell phones when you went in. And um, let's just go buy groceries and, and here, you know, whatever these sorts of things are. Um, but it also communicates really powerfully, I think, the community's willingness to say, you know, we are going to hold you to a standard, but we're also going to let you be among us and um, basically welcome you back into the community. Uh, and, and based on all the research, there's that sort of approach is absolutely um, going to be the more effective one. Isolation, um, the, the film talks a lot about, the, you know, the, the registry and notification and stuff has these very perverse effects. Um, they do, at a minimum, nothing, um, but, all, but potentially have really negative effects. And it's not hard to imagine why, right? Um, so just from a policy standpoint, I, I mean, I understand we have to have the registries, and I know that Vermont is actually much more humane. Um, and in fact, Vermont, the TIPS is famous all over the world for uh, having pretty good results. So uh, there's all kinds of things Vermont does that is, you know, way better than a lot of other places, and one of which is funding COSA and um, trying to create mechanisms for people to reintegrate back into communities. and, and um, I assure you that the, that other states are not doing that, um, especially Florida. Yeah, especially yeah. Florida. I mean, so um, 
So it, it's uh, my experience is that it is simple but profound. And, um, and the simplicity is just treating people as if they could be something other than just the worst thing that they ever did. Um, so anyway, that's it. Thank you all very much for your amazing comments. Um, Excuse me? That's why I don't know. Uh, here, open it up for questions if you want to ask. No, no. Okay. okay. Mark, would you like to make a comment? I would. I would. <laughs> if I would, I'm about to spontaneously combust. <laughs> I want to speak. I want to speak. Everybody can hear me. Everybody here? Everybody can hear me, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, I want to speak to the film itself and some of the comments that have been made. And let me preface, you know, that I am, I am a person who has survived multiple instances of sexual abuse since childhood, including incest. I also have a family member who at a very young age committed a sex offense and is on the registry. I believe that there are multiple issues. I mean, I couldn't be a black woman in America without looking at our criminal justice system and seeing everything that is wrong with it not only in relation to sex offenders, but to people who are commit, commit crimes in general. There's no rehabilitation. There's no forgiveness. We, you said all of that. I want to be a little bit more, less warm and fuzzy about sex offenders, right? And every adjective that you use in relation to sex offenders are things that people who have been victims of sexual assault feel. The desolation, the shame, the sort of isolation, all of that. And that does not, and what, what that film for me was so, every, every sex offender was a, a good person. Every sex offender might be a good person. But there, there's something between here and here. Yeah. There was no middle ground, and I'm not hearing any middle ground. All I want is to acknowledge that this is a reciprocal, as crime is, this is reciprocal. And so for whatever level of empathy and sympathy and sort of move for, to, to recognize the humanity of the offender, that for this particular kind of crime, we need to do equal, equal time to the people who have suffered at the hands of these offenders. And this is not about forgiveness. It's not about not healing. This is reality, right? That people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get right from coming back from sexual assault. There are people who never recover, whose lives are ruined as a result of sexual assault. That doesn't take away from anything that I have heard here, but I need to say that. I need to give equal time to the people who have suffered at the hands of these people, however good they are, not detracting from their humanity, but I need to say that. Right on. We need to That's think right. about go the other side of this as well. Yep, absolutely, very good. And Tony mentioned that there should be places available for Victim, so I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, yeah. Do you have another question? Well, you had your hand up way earlier, so let's go to you. Hi, I'm here to talk about the movie about COSA program. Um, I'm a sex offender. I did 10 years in jail. Um, I wasn't a very good person um, growing up. I didn't like myself. Um, I didn't like people. I've been 10 years the program in jail, but I moved jail this warehouse people and they put them on the shelf and they just leave them there. One day I heard about COSA. These people come up and talk to me. Um, Chief of Police, uh, South Burlington, uh, COSA. And uh, I listen to them and they come back every year and talk to me. And I'm ready to get out. And uh, I had my doubts and all that. Um, like I said, I was, didn't care about people, um, didn't care about getting out. It is scary getting out, it really is. It 
without the coastal team, South Burlington coastal team, and one person in Burlington coastal team, I don't think I'd be here today. Um, I consider myself a good person right now. Um, my main objective is not to reoffend ever again. Um, I hurt two people, not hurt them physically, but mentally. Um, COSA is people that really care. Um, they're beautiful people. They give people another chance. They, they're to listen. They're going to help you. My COSA team is awesome. Uh, I can tell, tell, tell them anything, anything at all, anything that's going on with me. I had no problem with that before I had. I never told anybody anything. Uh, the biggest thing is accountability. I love it. I hated it at first, but I love it now. Um, it's, just, it's just amazing. Since I've been in Costa, my, my life has turned around 100%. From negative to positive. Um, I thank them every day. Um, I do well every day. I do what I'm supposed to do. Um, since I've been in Kosa, I've been in trouble one time uh, when I first got out. It is scary when you get out, like I said, I did 10 years. It's scary. Um, and I laughed about the cell phone thing. Uh, when I got out, I had no idea about a cell phone. I didn't know how to work it. And uh, it's just funny. That's why I was laughing. I wasn't laughing at somebody. I was laughing at because the experience with cell phones was terrible for me. I didn't know anything about it. Um, COSA has given me a chance to meet different people, to sit down and talk with, with people. Honestly, um, I can pick up the phone anytime I want. And uh, if I have a problem, and I know one of my COSA people will be right there if I need them 24 hours a day. They're understanding people. Um, like I said, they're beautiful. My, my team is beautiful. I can't. I couldn't ask for a better team. Um, they got to be more closest. In jail, that's all they do is warehouse people. Okay? And uh, there's no program there besides AA. Um, I know I did 10 years straight and, uh, in jails. And that's all they talk about is robbing people, where they're going to get your next drug. Um, we need more coastal people. We need more people that will understand and give other people a second chance. Yes, I am a sex offender. Today I'm a good person. Before I wasn't. But with coastal, that's where I am today. And we do need more coastal people because I believe coastal works. Um, I see it work so many times. I know so many people that are in Costa right now, clients that are happy today, they have jobs. And you're right, when you, when you get out of jail and you say, you go look for a job and you say, well, yeah, I'm a sex offender. 99% of the time, the guy's gonna say, you tell how to get it. You know, there's gotta be another way of telling people, if you're a sex offender, if you were talking about different names, different categories, they gotta be because everybody, there's a thing that everybody hears sex offender automatic means that you're a bad person, that you're a piece of shit, excuse my language, but you're a piece of shit and you're no good and there's so many good people. I made a mistake, a big mistake. Um, and I still think about my victim, my victims, two boys, one 13, one 14. Um, I understand why I done it. I didn't before. Um, I take full responsibility. I don't blame it on anybody. That, that was on me. That was my decision. I take full responsibility. Um, but I just want to say we need a lot more closer because it's just amazing. You know, it, it's, people are it's just understanding, caring, passion. You know, they're there, they're there to help. They're there to give people another chance. God, we need closer. Please help us.
system offer an opportunity to participate in a coastal program when they're released? And I guess the second curiosity question, how many people do then become part of the COSA and accept those services? Derek, do you want to say anything? We have the director from the Department of Corrections of all the restorative justice programs. Uh, I'll very quickly say that, um, as Gary pointed out, we have a uh, target population of folks who are being classified as high risk and or high need. And uh, within that, we try to prioritize for sure folks who have committed sexual offenses. Anyone who's committed a sexual offense that's classified as high risk and high need uh, is um, uh, essentially afforded that opportunity if, if they're willing. Uh, and then we kind of drop down, if you will, to a broadened pool. However, there's more folks that uh, were there the capacity we would offer courses to. Um, and of those that are given the opportunity, I'd say the vast majority um, take it. And, and follow through, in part because they're offered the opportunity based on the informed decision of their caseworker, too. Um, the willingness to engage and uh, have a group of folks play a large role in their life um, is a key part. So that's what designates it also as a restorative <coughs> approach. It's predicated on a voluntary uh, decision to join. So, how do you talk more at another time about that? I can say uh, I've been in my position for a little over two years in Chittenden County, and lots of people don't uh, choose to ask to have a, a COSA, and there's lots of reasons why. I mean, it's, as he was saying, like you have to have a lot of trust, and a lot of people don't have that trust. It's a big commitment. But in the two years that I've been here, there hasn't been anybody who asked for a COSA that didn't get it. So. important reality check <laughs> that um, it's not just what the volunteer pool is not just the DOC selection process is that we can't seem to offer people housing. Housing is a huge issue. Yeah. Any other any other questions? That's right. Just one second I, I served as a um, member of the coastal team and it was it was really enlightening and grounding for me. Um, I'm, I'm not a sex fan. I, I do have a kind of history of drugs, um, which you know you don't need it. You don't need to be on a registry for. You know you still you know you still have a, a history that people can look up and, and hold it against you. Uh, but I do have a question about uh, the the woman in the movie who had was on is on the registry for life. And the situation where she had gotten a job with the newspaper after disclosing her criminal background, and someone uh, decided that uh, due to perception that it wouldn't be a good fit for her to be on that job. Uh, now this this might seem wild and crazy, but I do wonder if uh, if, if there's a if there's damages there, is there a lawsuit there? Like, like, I mean, to, to lose your job, you know, due to perception um, and something that you know, she didn't do anything wrong. Just curious about that. Well, is it Vermont's a right to work state? Vermont's a right to work state, so it's, been, it's kind of hard to pursue the damages. But as far as I know, I'm not aware of the social worker country. Um, but I can tell you that um, I just want to, just to dispel a little bit of myths, um, I have 
and I apologize if this is counter to any experience that anyone here has had or seen, but I'm actually continually impressed by Vermont employers. Um, I, most of my guys that I found supervision got jobs right away. I mean, some of them struggled, that's not to say that, but the vast majority of them got employment relatively quickly. Um, and I think that's been a shift. I think that's, that's been a shift that's happened in the last few years. But um, we, we would often find employers who would, um, would actually start calling the, the POs who handled sex offender cases, asking if we had anybody coming out of jail because they found that folks who are on for sexual offenses have a higher, um, well, they tend to be good workers. Um, they're not necessarily as broadly criminogenic as you might find with other offenders. So um, just to spell that myth, that there is employment out there and a lot of, a lot of good employers are willing to, um, to give people a chance. So, and that might be unique to the state. I don't know how that works across the country. I imagine it's, it's pretty unique. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Looks like not. Anybody have anything else they want to say? That your question didn't allow you to put out there? I just want to say to this woman who, I don't know your name. Margaret. Margaret. Mm -hmm. But I really appreciated what you said. And I think that part of, for me, what it's all about is sort of what you were talking about is there needs to be healing on all ends of the spectrum, and I don't think we do enough of that at all in this country. Um, and the voices of people who are victims need to be heard, the voices of people who are coming out of jail and want a second chance and really want to turn their life around need to be heard. And if somehow we can raise those standards, I think we would have a healthier society. It's part of the you know, alienation of being victimized, you feel alienated, feeling like you're, you victimize somebody, you feel alienated. Um, it's just not the way to go. It's not working. It's, it hasn't worked for a really, really long time. And um, so I really appreciate what you said, and I think we all need to come together around this and, and forgive. Forgiveness is really hard, and stigma is really hard. And you can have stigma as a victim, and you can have stigma as a person who was a sex offender or a drug dealer or a drug addict. And it's all bad, because as long as you have stigma, you're never gonna heal, man. You're just never gonna heal, because you're just gonna always feel like shit for the rest of your life. So we need to get beyond that. I, I just wanted to also thank the gentleman who was on supervision for coming. It takes yes. a lot of courage. Thank you. Know, you. I, I'm, I'm glad that we have somebody who's been through it to, here to talk about it. Thank yeah, you. thank you for sharing. Yeah, and I'll second what you said, and to Margaret, you know, as a victim myself, um, it is stunning what it takes for victims to heal. It is stunning. And many just don't. It, it, and it's, I've been very fortunate. I got a good education and had opportunity to get a lot of good help. But there's so many of us that do suffer from, and I count myself among these, in bad and fast eating disorders, addictions, all of depression, all kinds of things. And so often when we see people who are addicted or, you know, or have other issues going on, having some compassion and hearing people's stories before we label them is really important because we do need to be seen all the way through so that goodness can be seen in us and we can have a chance to you know, clear ourselves of the shame that goes with it and all the other the symptoms that come because of it. So I absolutely, Appreciate and applaud, and yes, you can do But you know, also, you. the women, largely, women, incarcerated women, are most of which are survivors yeah. of sexual yeah. violence. So it's a, it's yeah. a cycle, it's right. a system that just goes round and round. And so I'm a, a, in complete agreement that, you know, it begins with the way in which we deal with humans in general, no matter what the situation is. No matter what, you know, it's, quote, criminal, it doesn't matter. We have to figure out a way to work with humans in a more effective way that isn't punishment so people can understand how their behaviors hurt other people, yeah. right? Yeah. How they somehow affect the humanity of another person, whether it's from the point of incarceration, or victimization, whichever, you know, that, that for me is, is the key. And 
criminal justice system is not the answer. And when we connect center to center, if we can start there by connecting with our humanity, I call it our origination point, and we can connect from that place together, we're connected, and then we can work on the craft we have to work on, and then we'll have a hope and a prayer for doing it. So absolutely finding, opening our hearts and finding humanity in every person that's in every one of us. So thank you. Bring that up. So I want to thank all of our panelists. If we could do you give them a round of applause. I want to thank all of you for coming.